Hello, my name is Tori Miller and this is the postmortem of the Stafford University one-up internship. And um, today we're going to be going through a little bit about myself and about the one-up um, internship. We'll be looking at the project outline of each project within the one-up scheme. Uh, of this past year it was three. Over the last year before that it was technically two, but with a big priority on one single project. The overview is something we'll go through. Um, for me, specifically in this video, we are going to be looking at the Staffs First project, but there are two other projects which I will obviously go through too. There is uh, a lot of processes uh, with uh, designs and technical elements that I would like to touch on in today's presentation. And uh, just to take a look at two of the demos, go through a quick conclusion and a uh, closing statement. So, uh, an introduction about um, the project and myself. Um, I am a master's uh, computer games design student focusing on technical design specifically. I chose to study at uh, Stafford University due to being a uh, Taiga accredited uh, for its games design course. I think uh, that and Teesside are some of the top ones in the UK. So I thought, you know, why not? Perfect place to go to. Um, I was the third place winner of the Games Tech category at the Game Republic Student Showcase 2023, which was kindly given to me by Red Kite Games. And you can see a little bit about that and the other winners online. We actually had a few winners from the uh, from our Staffordshire University as well, which was uh, great that we could all kind of go and get awards together. Um, most recently, I created a short narrative horror game, which is published on HIO. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the presentation and ultimately I'm hoping to work with Team Reptile in the Netherlands, Rare in the UK or really anyone who likes to do kind of a bit more eccentric game design. So about the 1UP internship. It is a six week project which employs students to work in a studio based environment. So uh, we have the Epic Games Lab at the Stafford University and we all fill that area out over the summer period. and. It's just with the effort to emulate a, stu a um, studio environment effectively. In uh, 2023, like I said, we covered three projects. We covered Mechhead, uh, Mental Block, and Staffs First, which was from the previous year. We did actually touch on Mental Block a little bit the year before, very briefly, but this felt more hands-on and there was a lot more attention given to it. I was selected during 1UP in 2022 to work on Staffs First, uh, of which I applied using a online form. There was actually emails going around just saying, you know, if you are interested, apply. So I did. And then I contacted the organizers again in 2023 to get involved yet again, and they were kind enough to take me back on. I very much took a um, mentoring kind of, maybe not mentoring, but uh, a helping role across the three teams, as well as kind of being the lead on the Staffs First project. So I really wanted to kind of expand my skills as well as help other people with theirs, you know? So talking a little bit more about the three projects of the 1UP scheme 2023, uh, we first have Mechhead. For that, it was a top-down shooter adapted from an existing prototype, had a very kind of Borderlands feel in terms of, of its visuals, and it was very much classic arcade. Um, I worked alongside the programmers on a handful of features, just really kind of giving insights. So um, a lot of them had been more program orientated or didn't have experience with certain elements of the Unreal Engine. So I was just kind of there to facilitate that alongside a few other designers who were more into, you know, particle systems and things like that. So um, I was really kind of a little help there. Um, and also helped with the early weapon statistics and just generally helped with them throughout the first week most prominently, uh, that being the design team. For Mental Block, that was a Sokoban style puzzle game, which is a uh, Japanese genre of uh, puzzle games where you push blocks around. And that was again, adapted from an existing prototype. The UI art and UI animation rework was done by myself alongside Molly Swift, who helped with the logo, which looks fantastic. And also we had a uh, hold mechanic, which uh, just quickly going over that, the idea was initially to think what we could do as a USP was to have the player have to part design puzzles before they could complete them themselves. 
I thought that would be a good way to kind of reinvent the genre a little bit. Unfortunately, it was cut uh, due to time, but uh, the documentation does still exist and the game is also still terrific e either way. So um, yeah, the technical design work was kind of something I worked on a little bit there, here and there with this project. And I worked very closely with the lead programmer Arnav to implement a save system. I think we may have rewritten it about four times. It was mostly Arnav's uh, baby, but he he's fantastic. So uh, hats off to him. I think he now works at Flix Interactive. So hi Arnav. And then finally, um, Staffsverse, uh, which was a metaverse inspired virtual recreation um, to scale of the University Savitry campus now moving into campuses so we might be putting uh london uh staffordshire university london and stafford university stafford in there too potentially and the principle of behind this was effectively to take a um if you're familiar with vr chat or um some of the Fortnite levels which have been created to create this representation where people could really have a full in-depth virtual tour of the space um, without obviously needing to come to the campus for reasons being such as, um, you know, l long distance learners or people who just live too far away to actually be able to look or people with disabilities or just those who are really interested. It was kind of a really cool concept. And uh, yeah, like I said, it was made in UEFN for use in Fortnite. The original version was made in UE5, but we um, decided to work over to uh, Fortnite since they basically handle all of the server management. So having to set up, you know, servers and multiplayer networking is all just kind of a part of Fortnite. So it was kind of a no brainer really for us to be doing that. During um, 2023, early on, I was the sole developer uh, working with two environment artists. Um, I think there was a third who kind of worked on it briefly as well. And then uh, that was picked up from yeah, last year as one up uh, where I was, um, took a leading role on that as a designer and reworked from the ground up effectively. So a little bit about the project overview. Uh, the goal was to complete as much of the project as we could within six weeks, as well as learning a lot about the scripting language for UEFN or um, Unreal Engine for Fortnite. That is uh, Verse scripting language, which allows you to make things like NPCs, which I'll touch on soon, as well as a few other things. Um, like I'd mentioned before, it's also good for online networking. There was a lot to do with um, the reconstruction was uh, we really had to make sure that the scale was perfect. So in 2022, I went through and took satellite images of the campus ground and uh, a lot of blueprints and just placed them down as uh, planes, which is like a two dimensional um, 3D model with the image on, placed it down, made sure everything was to scale and kind of positioned everything through that. Um, which is actually a very effective way to very quickly be able to scale out an entire world as accurately as we possibly could. I think 2022, it might have taken about a week of time to really plan it all out and figure out what approach we wanted to take for that. And then after the fact, um, obviously when we ported from UE5 to UEFN, it was a breeze. We just had to copy things out of the project and know where everything was already placed. At this time, in 2022, we had mini games, narrative objectives that were um, designed by the entire team. I think it was a team of about 25 to 30 people to be completed in a multiplayer format. So that um, was removed effectively when ported since you don't have blueprints, which is the scripting language of Unreal Engine, of the base Unreal Engine in Unreal Engine for Fortnite. Instead, you have Verse which at the moment doesn't have features that allow us to perfectly replicate those designs that either myself or other designers had made. So it's really a case of just waiting for Verse to kind of come forward a bit more and find other ways around kind of getting those, uh, you know, it's, it's the essence of it really. If you go from, for instance, uh, C Sharp to C++, you would really have to rethink how you implement it, but I imagine you could probably get it done eventually. Um, we had to create a lot of new assets as well to match with the shift in art style. Originally, it was um, Staffordshire University on Mars, and we changed that to just a more general kind of Fortnite vibe, so very rounded with jaggy edges, very um, stylized. 
so the environmental artists that I work with, we just kind of talked through it. They looked at a lot of the assets and they were very happy to kind of follow through and did an amazing job with what they've got. So um, we carried over some features from the original project as well. So we did that without the use of blueprints and that would be the beacon bot NPCs, which again, I will talk about soon. And uh, development has continued post one up. So I'm still working on this with um, one of the environmental artists actually. And we've come a long, long, long way. We have been working on it quite hard. I've uh, taken some downtime recently, um, but they are <laughs> just chewing through all of the assets and it looks terrific. It looks really good and I'm excited for people to see it. So we did a uh, Moscow list here which you can see is a must have, should have, could have, won't have. And in 2022, I really specified what I wanted the project to contain and had to cut that down in 2023 since it was a, a much smaller team to consider what really had to be prioritized. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, things that we really struggled with here, there was um, the rework. There was a lot of content that did have to go um, as I've already mentioned, and a lot of the art assets were um, scrapped or just kind of reworked in some kind of way to kind of work with the new thing. So we did have the roads from the original project reused in a spline system. That, um, I think we have since actually changed those roads as well. So it's really a case of figuring out what fits where when you change art styles and when you change engines and when you have different features available to you, it's that is, uh, I would say, quite much the largest challenge of this project. So learning UFN's new uh, verse scripting language, uh, it was tough. It was really tough at first, but as soon as I kind of got myself around to the nuances of it, I would say, it was a lot easier to understand. Um, it's actually uh, a great tool for uh, newcomers to programming or coding, scripting, whatever you want to call it. So I'd recommend, you know, teenagers who are working with Fortnite to maybe give this a shot if they can, because I'd probably say this and C Sharp are useful to learn. I just struggled with them. I think I struggled with the syntax more than anything. Uh, if you can see in the screenshot, uh, in the top left screenshot here, you have uh, using, which you would use to include the libraries, which you do in other languages, but everything's in uh, braces and has different uh, operators, which are like mathem mathematical sim symbols. And I had a, I had to learn that on the in the six weeks. Uh, that was a little tough, I'd say. I also had to consider which mechanics could be ported to this new project. Again, NPCs, uh, the mini games as well, which I think I will probably start putting in soon. And the optimi optimization or too many assets. Um, the frame rate was actually quite low in the UE5 version from 2022 as we reached the end due to the amount of assets in the volume of the small level. So optimization was a consideration there. I would actually stripped out a bunch of objects and combined objects into something to make something called a, a draw call and basically do less draw call so it's less intensive on the GPU and that kind of helped a lot but um, UAFN itself has Nanite and a few other little tricks up its sleeve which really really helped with the uh, optimization aspects of this so a lot more assets in a small amount of space without really being a detriment to your computer's performance. Um, planning for the large-scale environments in-game. Uh, like I said, it took a week. It was tough, but I got there in the end. And working within the restrictions of a new engine um, was also a bit of a challenge. So... Next, we'll talk about a few specific things that I've uh, worked on within the project, uh, including the NPCs. So first, we'll look at the planning of the project. Um, starting over again with a uh, smaller team may have been difficult um, just due to the, I'm not going to call it stress because it wasn't a stressful experience, but the, uh, the workload was considerably larger per person, I would say, due to 
you know, how things were, but it was fine because there was no imposed deadline. It was just, you know, really get as much as you can get done, get familiar with the engine, we'll see what happens at the end. Um, source control is also terrific in UEFN. It actually has its own version of doing things. So in 2022, I wrote a guide for GitHub desktop, which um, we didn't actually need to use in 2023. It's like I said, it's all automated inside. All you've got to do is press a check-in button in the bottom right and everything else is fine effectively. Documentation is a must when it comes to planning, but it shouldn't be a focus when a short time scale is imposed. So be concise, which is something I definitely did with the documentation. I just basically did Moscow lists and um, notes on how UAFN works and is compared to UE5. So if anyone else jumped on the project, I could just kind of, you know, this is how this project works. Um, this is how this engine works. This is what we're doing. Almost like a, a pitch or like a brief that you can just kind of drop on somebody and they can read it in five minutes, I think helps a lot with these kind of projects at least. Um, referencing is absolutely vital for uh, scale and placement as well. So take a lot of photos. In 2022, I took the team out and we took photos all over the campus so that we had accurate uh, reference to everything. Um, when we were placing things down, we didn't have to go back outside. We could just look through our folders of photos and be, you know, is this part um, reasonably correct to what it should be? look like and we kind of followed that through again in 2023 but we already had those photos so we really did save a lot of time going forward and uh lastly scrums between key members will make things a lot smoother i believe that's part of uh, the like agile kind of uh design approach potentially so you all get together you talk about things you um pick out you know potential like latent issues and you iterate and then you just kind of go back to the project and you do that every week or so it just keeps everyone up to date it keeps everyone fresh and it's really recommended if you're working in a team environment for the gameplay design i did a lot of documentation here so there was a lot we couldn't include but that's also okay because um, we were able to do it in the 2022 version of the game. We learned a lot from it as a team, especially like a, the, working with the tech team and realizing I wanted to be a tech designer and understanding how these work on a technical level helped me understand the scope of what I was really asking the technical team. Um, for instance, the left one was a lot more difficult than I expected it to be because it was all about um, world space widgets which then allows me to also kind of consider how to design these kind of things and how to design the technical elements of these so I can pass them on to the programmers and say, hey, this is how this should be, or this is how we want it, and this is the method we would prefer to go for. And it just, it's really, really helpful for communication doing that kind of stuff. We've also got the, uh, the camera here. So this is just a basic showing how the view cam worked. Now, if I was gonna do this again, I'd probably include, you know, rough angles and rough directions and maybe comparison images to other games so that people have a good um, example of what it should actually be instead of just one single diagram. And then at the bottom here, we've got our remote binding. We actually had to uh, remove that technically, but then Fortnite has its own um, emote system anyway. so. Really, a lot of the stuff ended up being substituted more than outright removed, um, which was perfect, you know? You could just kind of look at things and be like, oh, I want this, I don't want this, I want this, I don't want this, and then shuffle through it and then get an approximation of what you had originally. So on a macro scale, uh, this is how we had originally designed it with the staffs on Mars design. Everything was in geodomes, like giant glass um, domes with tubes going between them um, kind of similar to the moon episode of Futurama if you're familiar with that at all and uh, for the for the things here I effectively just kind of went through and said this is where all the different parts are as a point of reference for the design team and the art team I did one that was more sp um, specific and one that was less spe uh, specific and overlaid the uh, satellite image on it as well so it was just 
really to kind of draw as many comparisons to the real world as possible so never, no one ever got lost during the project. And then in the micro scale, um, we had luckily some of the blueprints of all of the buildings just provided to us. And for signage locations, we just looked at the reference photos that we took and we went through and made a big table and just passed it on to the art team and said, can you, you know, make text on the signs for all these different parts? We made sure to keep it modular as well. So it's just the one kind of asset that we could edit and put different signs onto, which is something we can consider going forward into the 2023 version of the project. Lastly, uh, one of the big challenges and concerns, uh, definitely a safety concern, was we couldn't just have the entire layout of the ins inside of the university available for anyone to be able to see. So what I had considered was having a cube map display of the room to show roughly what it looks like inside for the interiors of buildings, but really put more of a focus on the student work more than the layout. So really just kind of abstract the inside of areas, just have the same corridors, but different kinds of rooms. Um, just so you got the essence, but not the exact layouts of places, because we really didn't want to be endangering students. So for our terrain generation, um, we originally used these satellite height maps from uh, this website. You can actually click and find anywhere in the world, which was very helpful. And we had um, the terrain, like the topology of the world itself kind of based on those projections uh, it converted it out into a height map and put it in to unreal engines terrain generation unfortunately there was a lot of artifacting which is um compression on images which creates pixelized uh, pixelation and strange kind of um discolor uh, discoloration which when it was transformed into the um terrain using the generation tool um, it had a lot of issues with it that it had to be smoothed out using the smoothing tool, which was a very long process and definitely something that could have been considered to be done differently. So even though terrain sculpting came to the rescue, there are non-destructive techniques that we could use to port the content in UEFN. So that would be a spline-based system. And while it is mostly non-destructive, uh, terrain painting itself is not non-destructive. So it, any kind of brushes that you do to the world can technically be undone and flattened, but it can't be completely trimmed back to how it originally was. Whereas with the spline system, you can um, put dots and then move them around and then create islands from that. So that's the approach we are now taking versus the original one. But we have still considered the scale and position of things using the satellite. So it's not like that technique was all for nothing, I'd recommend using that technique to find the location of scale and things, overlay it on the world, and then use the spine tool to draw the island out yourself and then place all of your world accordingly or your buildings accordingly to that. So for level mashing, um, areas needed to reflect the real world um, and match with a pre-existing art style we were allowed to take liberties with the assets since it has a art style to it. It wasn't just real world as its art style. So originally staffs on Mars and then into Fortnite, we could really kind of jag up edges. So it was nice that the artist could do that. And when it came to level meshing and set dressing, it didn't have to be one to one. You know, it wasn't every leaf had to be in the same place. It was a stylization of a real world. Uh, UEFN actually has a lot of assets ready to use as well, including those leaves, like I'd said. And um, we kind of considered that you should not put identical assets next to each other and make it feel too game-like. So in those cases where we couldn't really do that, like um, limitations being like uh, the amount of trees we had, I would rotate and uh, rescale on certain axes to make them look different enough that you couldn't be like, hey, that's the same tree twice. So here's a photo reference from the photo references that we took on the left. And on the right, this is an area that I'd meshed out and uh, the bushes themselves, the trees and the foliage are all from the UEFN. The box planter in the background is something I'd modeled. Um, the text on the wall was something I uh, made in Photoshop to replicate the um, theater, that's uh, the Flexman theater. 
and Flaxman in the background from what you can see in the foreground is actually the um, Beacon building and then you can see Henry in at the very back. It was important that I kind of looked at it from a um, forward perspective and not just from top down as well to kind of get an idea of you know height and making sure things didn't feel too big because I didn't want it to feel almost like you're in a toy box as soon as we played the game and having to rescale everything and taking more time. For the NPC implementation, there was no option for changing a mesh's animations and uh, the devices, uh, devices being um, similar to blueprints, you effectively take, um, for instance, the dialogue device will create dialogue on the screen as text or the sound device will make sound. So it's really a single function thing, but they're always independent of each other. So I couldn't connect them all together. So, and the devices cannot be consolidated into one script. So you can actually use verse to kind of make references to devices to fire them off, you know, execute their functionality, I guess. So, um, however, they could be controlled. So what I did for this was effectively, um, bulk all of the devices together into one thing and then group them, which means if you move one, they all kind of move as a unit. And if you copy paste them, it copy paste them all as a unit. And then I started to create this custom NPC script. The approach for it that I took was effectively like um, object pooling. So you would um, to put one mesh under the ground with the character for one animation and then one above. And when you interact with them, it'd swap their places. But it turned out I didn't actually need to do that because you can destroy and swap them around. So then I ended up destroying one and creating the next one and vice versa. And then just keeping a reference to what those were. So you can actually see here in the script in the center how I've um, created a bespoke tool effectively. So you could drag and drop it in. You could change the name of the NPC, what the NPC says, which gave designers free reign to really kind of characterize each uh, beacon bot NPC, which could then be dropped in next to buildings and, you know, say, oh, this is this, is this building and this does this thing and this does this thing to kind of help virtual visitors understand how the world operates and learn a bit more about staff's university campus itself. So looking at the successes and achievements here, um, all of the points of interest, like I'd said before, were ac accurate to their real world counterparts. The planning and organizing for each milestone, we actually hit most of those milestones, which is great. And um, just to kind of celebrate everyone who wasn't there for 2023, who was in 2022, there were a bajillion successes there. You know, there was all the mini games, there was the sticker book and journal, cutscenes, quests. Um, the art team had made a cohesive art style amongst themselves. I think it may have been their second collaborative project as well. So it's just really all around is terrific, the amount of um, successes we had in both years. So now we're going to look at the demos for um, both projects on both years. So we were limited by the um, reduced team size, which was in some ways also good because we didn't have to do as many scrums because there was, you know, only three of us and one designer. So it was mostly just work, 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 and not work kind of interspersed by meetings. So, uh, you know, good and bad. The new version of Unreal, there was a lot to be learned and you'll see between the two different versions how the assets have also changed as well. So let's take a look at the original one. As you can see here, you would enter your name originally. Um, there was a bit of an issue where we, we were worried back then that you could effectively put in, you know, curse words or something. So we decided to not do that effectively, which is good because um, Epic Games have their own moderation. So, you know, you, you can't have curse words in your username in uh, Fortnite effectively. We couldn't do this part here. So I had included in the newer version, which you can't see in that video, unfortunately. But I will just pull them up side by side so you can actually see how this works. Just the campus and roads everything kind of seamlessly put together and here it is in the old version. 
So the Avatar from Fortnite is uh, taking place of that one. We actually had Kratos from God of War in one version of it, um, since he's in Fortnite. Whereas in the original version, we had um, still the mirroring of the minimap and uh, targets and the roads and everything. But we had different avatars. We had our own avatar. We had um, a few different buildings. And I, I guess in a way it allowed us to kind of cap areas off as well in a very sciencey way. Um, which we had to rethink for the new version of the project. This is just uh, showing here the stargazing minigame which I had created from uh, with one of the texts. So I did all the designs that you had seen before and this is just how they were doing it. There was a lot of prototyping that was done that hadn't been wrapped up at this point. And I will say the project ran really well on high-end PCs. It's just if you run it on a low-end PC, the frame rate did start to drop, which UEFN has now fixed a lot of that. A lot of the things you do see here, including tables, are now actually in the project, which you don't see in the right video. The idea of having this kind of uh, Michael Jackson-esque lighting up of the roads as well was something we will probably be including in the new version. Just to, It was a design idea I had to create play spaces out of the ordinary, effectively. Just to see if I could get players to just, you know, jump between them and play around. Because you do see that a lot in games, you know, um, people jump into lobbies and they just jump around together and do things. So. Uh, I would really like to see that in the new version as well, because I feel like it inhabits the whole concept of learning and play, which a university to do with games is obviously going to be very much about, I suppose. There's a lot of NPCs here, like you can see the really big beacon bots, they're really buff, so maybe they might get re-included, but for the time being we do just have the original beacon bots. So in conclusion, uh, 2022 improved a lot of my planning, design and soft skills, especially with my confidence. Um, I used to be quite shy, so the team-based work really kind of pulled me out of my shell. A lot of amazing people in that project. And 2023 improved my technical understanding of Unreal Engine as well, especially um, to do with optimization, learning new uh, programming um, languages or scripting languages, and kind of pushed my design skills a little bit more as well. Um, just in terms of kind of rethinking things that I'd done a year prior, um, you'd be surprised how you can kind of learn from yourself. I'd recommend looking back at your own projects from a year ago and see where you've come to over the past year and what you could have learned or what you might pick up and then be like, oh man, I did that. And, you know, just do better, I guess. Um, a portion of professional work is research and learning as well, so it does not stop after university is something I would like to mention. Um, even in my master's degree, which I'm doing right now, it is primarily research, so just make sure you're always learning, make sure you're comfortable with the concept of always having to research and look into new things, because that will be probably a large part of your job if you go into the industry. I actually found a love for the set dressing of game worlds as well. Um, I didn't realize how much I would have enjoyed it. I never got around to placing meshes in the world and doing sort of um, level design, I would maybe call it. But when I actually got around to it, I, it's it's therapeutic, it's cathartic, it's nice, and you can kind of look at references, get inspiration, and kind of start to build things up from the amazing art of the artists on your team. It's like, It's just relaxing, it's nice. Networking is built in for UEFN, which it wasn't for UE5, so um, that's ready to use and it's terrific. And uh, I'm now continuing to work on the project post one up as well, so I still work on staffs for us right now, as I mentioned at the start. And uh, yeah, so here's some of the new um, things that I've done. So on the left is some of the meshing that I just mentioned. I've really been enjoying the meshing, so I mesh all the area out. And then on the right is the catalyst building. I actually modeled that myself as well. I'm not really an environmental artist. I have done environment art, but it's just going to help with the workload because it's just two of us at the moment. And it's fun. I really enjoy it. So you can find me at my um, email, which you can see here. This is my personal email address. 
Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, List Wi-Fi, um, where I speak about games development and my own projects. You can find me on LinkedIn at um, NestRD, which is a Nest Research and Development, or you can find me on my portfolio, which is nestrd.github.io, where um, I actually have my horror game, which I mentioned at the start of this presentation, uh, free to play. So um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and thank you very much for listening.